second graders, I thought I'd check back in with you and would see how John Midas is doing with his chocolate touch. Last time we heard that Susan, he was trolling everything that happened and how stuff was turning into chocolate and she was not happy with him and wouldn't let him play jump rope. The rest of that morning passed slowly for John. He was afraid that his mother was going to be cross about the missing gloves. She might not accept the excuse that he had eaten them. He regretted his messed up arithmetic test. He was sad about Susan's anger and disbelief, and he was getting terribly thirsty. Once during geography and once during art, he was excused to get a drink. Both times, however, he swallowed nothing but sweet chocolate. His mouth was getting stickier and sweeter and drier by the minute. Chapter seven. All right, boys and girls, Miss Flimsel said. It's almost time for lunch. Clear up your things, paint pot securely closed, brushes washed, paintings unpinned and laid out to dry, drawing boards stacked against the wall. Ah, there's the bell. Front row first, Timothy leading, then Robin in single file, go. John, alone, walked slowly in the throng, hurrying along the corridors to the school cafeteria. The school was proud of the cafeteria and the food served in it. The room was spacious and bright with windows all the way along one side overlooking the playground and the playing fields beyond. The opposite side was wholly taken up by the shiny silver service counter. Several boys and girls were already settled at tables by the time John took his place in the line. Enviously, John noticed a boy at a nearby table suck at straws dipped in a milk bottle that was dull with frost. John could imagine the refreshing taste of cold, creamy milk. At another table, a group of girls were eating fat, red cherries. John could almost feel the firm fruit on his tongue and the pleasure of biting through the tart, juicy pulp. The cherries must taste good. They must be thirst quenching. John unhappily took a tray from the pile and slid it along the rails in front of the top of the counter. He put a paper napkin, a glass, and a gleaming spoon, a knife, and a fork on the tray. It seemed hardly worth the while, but he felt he might as well try the food and drink. Perhaps if I eat in a different way without any, letting anything touch my lips, he muttered, my lunch won't all change to chocolate. He was not very hopeful. What? asked the boy standing next to him. Nothing, John said. I thought you heard said, I heard you say something about chocolate, the boy said. I hope this is the day for chocolate cream pie, he added. That'd be super. On chocolate cream pie days of the past, John had been known to skip the main course so that he might spend all his lunch money on dessert. The thought of four pieces of chocolate cream pie now suddenly made his stomach feel as though he were on a roller coaster, an uneasy, flibberty jibberty sensation. John shuddered. Okay, he commented, wrinkling up his nose. The other boy shrugged his shoulder and started to choose his meal. John took a plate of cold chicken and ham, potato chips, and a crisp, moist lettuce and tomato salad. The white of the chicken, the pink of the ham, the gold of the potatoes, the pale green of the lettuce, and the red of the tomato looked so delicious. He also took half a pint of milk, a thick whole crusted wheat roll, and a cool pat of butter, a tumbler of water with ice cubes clinking in the glass, and a dish of fresh fruit, slices of orange and grapefruit and banana and grapes. John's tray was loaded with just the sort of meal his mother was always trying to persuade him to eat. Until today, John had always thought it was pretty dull to eat sensible things when there were sweeter food and drink to be had. Today, however, the sensible things looked most appetizing and his mouth began to water in its new, sticky way. John paid for the lunch with the money that his mother had given him, went to an empty table, and sat down. His fingers trembling slightly with eagerness, he cut a slice of lettuce. His fork went through the leaves with a promising crunch. He stuck the prongs of the fork into a, a mouse-sized piece of lettuce and carefully inserted it into his mouth. The lettuce didn't touch his wide stretched lips. John's teeth came together in a crisp layers of sweet chocolate. He took a small place of potato chip, tilted it back his head until he was looking straight up at the ceiling and dropped the morsel straight down into his throat. 
He felt it go down, a sharp fragment of sweet chocolate. He tried the milk, the ice water, the fruit. Every solid and liquid that he sampled was transformed as soon as it entered his mouth. Then he became aware of a shocking novelty that he hadn't noticed at breakfast. At the rim of each glass, there was a small semicircle of opaque brown. The bowl of his spoon and the prongs of his fork had become brown. As John watched, horrified, the areas of magic chocolate slowly spread until at last the glasses and cutlery were all solid chocolate. The trouble was unquestionably growing worse. John's scalp tightened with fear. What am I going to do? He asked himself miserably. Oh dear, oh dear, what is going to happen to me? Leaving his tray of chocolate food and drink and utensils, John stumbled away from the cafeteria and out onto the playground. Chapter 8. English class passed without incident. Miss Plimsoll distributed word lists for her pupils to take home. The more words you know, she explained as always, the more exactly you can think. There were some difficult new words, John noticed. Avarice, indigestion, acidity, unhealthiness, moderation, and digestibility. As Miss Plimsoll explained the meaning of each one, it seemed to John as though they all had a special bearing on his present uncomfortable condition. At last, the bell rang. Very well, class, Miss Plimsoll said. Time for outside activities. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Miss Plimsoll. Miss Plimsoll gave the signal for dismissal, and the pupils in the front row filed out, followed by those in the second row, including John and Susan. Susan played a violin, a violin in the school orchestra and usually she and John went to the rehearsals in the auditorium together. This time, Susan hurried on ahead of him. John followed very slowly. The members of the orchestra were sitting at their music stands on the auditorium stage when John, carrying his dark blue trumpet case, got to his chair in the brass section. Mrs. Quaver had already begun to explain a difficult passage to the girls who played the, who played the flute. Just after Jay sings, Nestlings chirp and flee, she was saying. You come in with your trill. doodle oodle oodle -oo. Do you see the place on your score? Good. Ah, John, Mrs. Quaver exclaimed, seeing him in place. I'm glad you're not absent. As I have just told the others, this afternoon we're having the first joint rehearsal of my arrangement of a boy's song by James Hogg. We've been all over the individual parts in all the sections, now you will call. Now it's time to fit the pieces together. John nervously opened his trumpet case and took out his shining golden trumpet from its bed of scarlet silver. The beautiful new instrument gave him confidence. He worked the valves nimbly with his fingers and looked up at Mrs. Quaver again. Now, John, she said, tell me when your little solo begins. Right after the end of the second verse, John promptly replied. He had practiced his part every evening in the basement at home for the last two weeks. He knew every note perfectly. After the line, that's the way for Billy and me. Good, Mrs. Quaver said, and don't forget what I told you, John. This is a happy song. I want you to play ta-ta, 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 simply repeating the rhythm of the voice. And I want you to be light and lively. This is supposed to be a song of the boy who loves romping in the country. Ta-ta, ta-ta, ta-ta-ta, ta, John thought. That shouldn't be too difficult, even with the whole orchestra listening to him. He had played it over and over again at home. But he would have to try extra hard here. This would be his very first solo. Everyone else was depending on him to play it properly. Right, said Mrs. Quaver brightly. With her baton, she rapped twice sharply on the music stand before her. All the musicians brought their instruments into playing position. Susan poised her bow over the strings of her violin. John held his trumpet close to his mouth and wiggled his fingers on the valves. Mrs. Quaver's baton moved from side to side, up and then down. The cymbals clashed and the drums thumped. The pianist brought his fingers down on the ivory keys of the piano. The violinists and cellists made their wheeling and whumping sounds. All were in perfect unison. The rehearsal had begun. After the introduction, one of the older boys began to sing. Where the pools are bright and deep, where the gray trout lies asleep, up the river and over the lee, that's the way for Billy and me. After the last line of the first verse, John's fellow trumpeter echoed the rhythm of the singer's voice. Ta-ta, ta-ta, ta-ta-ta-ta. 
Mrs. Quaver smiled approvingly at the successful performance and with her baton gave the singer the signal to begin the second verse. Where the blackbird sings the latest, and oboe went peep. Where the hawthorn blooms the sweetest, where the nestlings chirp and flee. The flute warbled according to plan. That's the way for Billy and me. John swallowed with an effort and put the mouthpiece of the trumpet to his lips for his solo. The mouthpiece instantly chained to chalk. Then almost as fast, the chocolate spread along the instrument, changing all the flashing gold into dull brown. The first note came out fairly true, ta, but chocolate trumpets cannot withstand much pressure. The hole in the mouthpiece softened and clogged up, and the valve stuck as John desperately tried to finish his part. Mrs. Quaver's eyes almost popped out of her head as she listened to him play, ta, ta, chu, ta, chu. It sounded as though John were trying to play a soap-filled bubble pipe. Terribly flustered, he put down his trumpet. Mrs. Quaver was speechless. The orchestra was rocked by uproarious laughter. The other trumpeter leaned over toward John's chair and picked up the trumpet. It's a chocolate trumpet, he shouted derisively. No wonder it sounded like that. John Mattis was trying to play a chocolate. John didn't wait to hear any more. He fled from the stage and out to the playground. Without stopping even to look around, he ran through the stone gateway way and homeward. Chapter 9. Oh, the shame of it! The humiliation! John wept breathlessly as he ran, shocked and frightened, indignant and angry at the world that had suddenly turned against him. Mean old things, John thought, blaming Miss Plimsoll and Mrs. Quaver for his failures, even though nothing that, they had, that had happened to him had been their fault in any way. Horrible old school, he thought, even though he had liked school until that morning. Hateful Susan, he thought, even though he knew at the same time that he was really longing for her to be friendly with him again. Through the window, Mrs. Midas saw John coming up the pathway. Hello, John, dear, she called from the living room. You're home early today. How nice. As a reward, there'll be a piece of chocolate after supper. I hate it, John shouted. He was crying too hard to say anything else for the moment. When she heard the sound of his voice, Mrs. Midas rushed into the hall. Why, what's the matter, dear, she said, pointing her arm around him. John twisted away from her grasp, ran past her, and started up the stairs toward his bedroom. Susan doesn't want me at her birthday party, he said as he went. I know she doesn't. Well, I won't go to her rotten old party anyway. I don't think you really mean that, Mrs. Midas said. Besides, she added, and John was halted by the softness in her voice. Mrs. Buttercup just telephoned to say she was going to drive over herself at four o'clock to pick you up. She did? John said, blinking down at his mother from the top of the stairway. Yes, she did, Mrs. Midas assured him. So you'd better hurry and get yourself washed and brushed. Your party clothes are laid out on your bed. There were games on the Buttercup's lawn while it was still warm enough outside. Later, the party supper, including the birthday cake, was going to be served indoors, and there would be a magician and a short movie. John joined in the blindman's bluff and grandmother's footsteps and fox and geese, and soon he became more cheerful. He even temporarily forgot about chocolate. Susan looked very pretty. Her yellow curls had been brushed so hard that they looked silkier than ever. She was wearing a big blue ribbon the same color as her eyes. Her cheeks were flushed with excitement, a deeper pink than her party dress. On her feet were dainty little white socks and white shoes with straps that buttoned. Between games, Susan smiled at John and said, I'm glad you came. They seem to be on good terms again. Then Mr. Buttercup approached, bringing a bucket of water from the garage. He set it down in the middle of the lawn without spilling a single drop. We're going to duck for apples, Susan whispered to John. The boys against the girls. You can be the captain of the boys' team. We're going to stop right there and continue some more next time. I hope you guys are doing great and talk to you later. Bye.